to uh, introduce our uh, our opening uh, speakers who are going to uh, do our land acknowledgement today. So uh, this is Gary George and Ginny Blankenship, and they're going to uh, have our opening. Thank you. Welcome to the traditional territory of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam, Kwikwetlem, and Akatsi Indigenous Nations. In Canada, or in British Columbia, there are 23 distinct nations and 23 distinct languages in British Columbia. So we have a, a largest uh, number of languages in Canada lo located right in British Columbia. I'm from the Enkakatan Nation, which is from the interior of British Columbia. I too am a visitor on this land, so I work here. I've been here for thir over 30 years, so I enjoy this territory immensely. I am uh, in the Faculty of Education. I'm the Director of Indigenous Education. I've just started here, so thank you for uh, welcoming us. This is Gary George, so he's going to do a welcome song. Thank you very much. Um, as Jenny mentioned, my name is Gary George. I'm originally from northern BC, small community, um, Smithers. Has anybody been mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. Right? That's where I was born and raised. Um, I actually say Smithers, but I was originally from Telfa, which is a small community east of Smithers. Um, back, back in the day, there was only 600 people, and it was the world to me. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up coming to, the, to SFU over 10 years ago. I trained as a teacher as well. I went through the PDP, which is hard to believe, over 10 years ago. And I did the Northwest Teachers Education Consortium. And I became a teacher and I taught a short stint in elementary and high school and I even taught math. And, um, but that was over a little over a decade ago. And I'm gonna drum a song for you. And I brought three drums in case there's somebody out there that's willing to just drum along. You know, no pressure. <laughs> just drum along. Follow me. <clears throat> and what I do with this song is I call out uh, international greetings, or I call out uh, local cities. And so people would, uh, if you hear your city, you can just jump up. And you can just go, oh, oh. <laughs> Got one more drum with somebody else. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. So the other the other thing is I brought a copy of the Office for Aboriginal People newspaper today. It's caught off the press two hours ago. So it's got all sorts of news about what's been happening at SFU over the last year. We'll leave some, some back there for people to take if you wish at the end of the session. And uh, there's some interesting stories in there about reconciliation. And um, little do these ladies know, but they get a gift for drumming. Of <laughs> <laughs> so, drumming or for drumming? <laughs> so all you have to do is follow along. And is there an international flavor here? Like, yeah. Can you name some countries? Brazil, Ecuador, Ecuador, China, Hong Kong, China, Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Hong Kong. Yeah. Turkey, Turkey, oh. India. Yeah. Okay, so what I'll These do? These are guests from the UK. And the, and the UK. UK. <laughs> okay. So what I've done with the song? I, I've taken a traditional song from my people and I've modified it. And what I do is I call out international greetings. And if you hear your international greetings, usually what you do is uh, the whole idea is you take pride in where you're from. So in other words, you, um, you basically, when you hear your international greeting or your country, usually you just go, ho ho! <laughs> <laughs> yep. And this song, I've modified it a bit. Sometimes where I'm from, they'll use it to they'll call out clans or uh, local First Nations, and they'll hold money up. And sometimes the people will dance up and they'll drop it right in front of the drummers. And they'll drop the money right there. But you don't have to do that. <laughs> but you don't have to do that. 
have to do that today. I've seen people have a lot of fun with it. They just hold up the money and go, oh, and then they come up and they dance, and they drop food from the comments. And I've also seen it used to raise money for emergency. So just say, for example, up in northern BC, where I'm from, let's say if a family had an emergency, they had to fly directly to Vancouver, mm -hmm. uh, gathering like this, they would drum the song, and uh, they would just call out different clans or whatever, and the people would just come up and they would just drop money in the front, and they would collect the money, they would have a witness count the money, and then they would give it to the, to the family in need. And I've seen uh, a lot of money raised that way. For, for various emergencies, so, so I, I've modified the song a bit, and it's meant to, um, I've done it at elementary schools where I call it grades, and especially the elementary students, they love it. They just get up and go, grade one, you know. <laughs> but it's a little bit more difficult at high school for some reason. <laughs> so anyways, we'll just drum the song, and I hope you enjoy it, and all we have to do is follow along. No pressure, and um, we'll just say the story. <clears throat> Look there. Maybe you can call it the greens. So just tell me the greens, and I'll, I'll call them. Uh, Sunday,
As I, as I mentioned, I have some newspapers here. I'll just leave them at the back. And if you want to take a copy, please just take a copy. And um, basically, as I mentioned, caught off the press a couple hours ago. So um, it's an honor to be asked to come and drum. And um, I just had a question for, because there's a lot of talk about reconciliation, this paper touches on all the activities that are going on at SFU in the last year. Uh, does anybody know why? Why, um, why are traditional territories acknowledged? Does anybody, can you, does anybody know why that's come into practice over the last, probably the last decade? Does anybody? Because they're unseated and it's acknowledging they're unseated? Yes, exactly. Uh, unseated basically means it goes way back to 1763. Uh, some of this stuff is very controversial, but it goes back to we're Commonwealth nation. And in 1763, King George III wrote the Royal Proclamation of 1763, and he basically stated in the Royal Proclamation that protection measures have to be put in place for the Indigenous people, including setting aside parcels of lands, which are reserves, and they should be allowed to hunt the fish as they always have before the coming of the, the cockroaches. And um, um, so basically myself, like I remember when I was a young, young guy, I was still now, <laughs> but I do remember when I was a kid growing up, I had people, non-Indigenous people saying, Gary, why do you guys get to hunt and fish without, uh, with, uh, without uh, getting licenses and stuff like that? And I didn't even understand it myself. And they were asking me, but it all goes back to the, this proclamation. And, um, you know, like the whole thing about Aboriginal or Indigenous issues, the, the analogy I like to use is, um, you know, about two months ago I came up with this analogy. I, I went to go visit some friends and they were watching this movie called Seeing This Pedigree or something. You know, they came into the movie about a quarter of the way through. And I was going, what's going on here? Couldn't figure out exactly what was going on in the movie until sort of towards the end. And I was still kind of, you know, it was hard to watch a movie a third of the way through. And I believe that's what ha is happening with not only indigenous issues, but many issues. Uh, we're born into a system where things have already been happening. And, and even myself, I have questions about the whole indigenous thing. Like I remember when I was, you know, um, I remember when people were saying, um, when I was talking to my uncle, he, he really fought for indigenous issues. He basically said, uh, I told him, I said, why do we have to fight for these issues? Why should we drum on national TV? And he says, you're doing it for your, the people before you. And, and he said, and he said uh, look at the Royal Proclamation. <laughs> and so it goes back to this whole thing about unceded territories. Very controversial issue, but what it boils down to is the lands traditionally or legally are still First Nations. And it's very, as I mentioned, very, very controversial. It it's, um, can be very, very polarizing. And I actually do mention that in this. Uh, there's an article in here, short article on me, and it asked me about uh, when I was doing Philosopher's Cafe. And they basically said, uh, one of my questions, or one of my comments, very polarizing. So, hope you grab a copy of this, and that's Thank it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. and uh, sharing with us the paper and, and your stories. And um, we just have a small gift to thank you for, thank for you your time. Thank you. Yeah, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great, great session. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> Juices are we're just going to get stuck in. So um, I also have the pleasure today to introduce our guest speakers. 
uh, Professor Deborah Yadell and Martin Lindley. Deborah Yadell is a professor of sociology in the School of Education at the University of Birmingham. And she has written extensively in the areas of policy, practice, and inequalities, uh, including in, uh, well-known books, School Trouble, Identity, Power, and Politics in Education, Impossible Bodies, Impossible Selves, Exclusion and Student Subjectivities, Rationing Education, Policy, Practice, Reform, and Equity. And uh, uh, this was an award-winning book co-published with David Gilbert. In her most recent work, she has now responded to a growing interest in the assemblage of the social and the biological. And uh, this has uh, resulted in a, uh, working closely with her colleague, Dr. Martin Lindley, who is a molecular biologist from Loughborough University. Together, Deborah and Martin have explored the emerging knowledge in the biological sciences with sociological accounts of schooling to generate new insights into learning and the learner. This has culminated in their recent, uh, we've completed book, Biosocial Education. And uh, I think that's available through Rutledge this year. And is there a subtitle or no? <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. Okay. okay. So it's not quite available. Not, <laughs> oh, not quite available, but we're, this uh, hopefully we'll hear some aspects of this today. So thank you very much. And uh, um, if you can please uh, thank join you. us. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Hello, thanks so much for inviting us. It's really, really great to be here. Um, we, what we, we are, we've been writing this book, um, Biosocial Education, together, and it's, kind of, it's getting towards being ready to send to the publisher. So what we're, what we're doing today is sharing some of the ideas that we're developing and exploring in that. Um, and really, we want to make a case that, the so that sociology and biology should collaborate with each other. Um, in some settings, that's quite a contentious um, argument to make, um, and we've made it individually and, and, to, and collaboratively in different places in the last year or two. Um, and for some people, it challenges some of the, kind of the fundamental premises of sociological and social science inquiry. Uh, so, some of that contentious ground is is what we what we anticipate we'll explore and hopefully that will be interesting and engaging and challenging. So um, wrong wrong one. Is this working, Martin? Yeah. Thank you. I'm reading my computer, but we're working with a different computer. So our purpose today, we want to make this case for um, biosocial inquiry in particular in relation to the materiality of learning. We, we move, certainly I move from a position that to say what a well-established field education is, we actually know relatively little about learning and there's, there are lots of, that we, we have lots of theories about learning but we don't know so much about learning and often when we talk about learning what we end up talking about are proxy measures for, for learning. We end up talking about outcomes or we end up talking about things that we observe in children. Um, and it may or may not be uh, satisfying to us to call that learning. So one of the things that, um, that we want to do is think about the materiality of learning and what, how else we might understand learning through, through that move. Um, so we're looking at intersections between sociology and biology and um, suggesting that we might, we might combine a, a mapping of a learning assemblage through ethnography and uh, bioscience techniques such as methylation studies, mass spectrometry, brain imaging, uh, some fields that um, <coughs> cause more or less consternation among some critical sociologists of education. As we do this, we want to engage with this idea of con concept metamorphosis from Catherine Malibu um, so that we're transforming the, the conceptual tools that we, that we bring to this work. And I think increasingly as we work together, it's actually that space of metamorphosis that's demanded 
of all of the people in the collaboration that becomes more and more um, comes, becomes more and more important. <coughs> the, that conceptual work, in many ways, seems to be more important than the, the method questions. For instance, you know, will we use mass spectrometry or will, will we use brain imaging? Is maybe less important than whether or not we can find a conceptual space where we can work together. Um, and one of the things that, that I found quite useful in, in doing that is going back to Judith Butler to think about her work on degrounding and that it's when we don't know where we stand that, um, that something useful or interesting might be happening. Um, and telling myself that so therefore that's okay to, to feel that, that degrounding. And so we want to advocate for, for education that responds to this biosocial reading. Um, and we'll hopefully have, think also about the methodological political implications of, of what we're suggesting we're going to do. So, Martin? What I'm going to do now is sort of set the scene of where we come from. I'm assuming many people in the room already know Deborah's background and don't know mine because I'm the interloper in this <laughs> But that, that status of interloper, I think, gives us a wonderful space in which to have discourse and to engage with each other. Uh, one of the things lacking from the, the biology and the biological sciences is an engagement with the environment and in a greater picture. The more and more I see and discuss and in involve myself with the social sciences, I see exactly the same mirror image in the lack of engagement and discourse with the bio side of it. So I'm sitting in the middle, really, saying that I'd like to have an engagement, but where are we coming from, and who am I having engagement with? Uh, the talk today, really, Deb took a 12 months Royal Society Fellowship, uh, extended that into a, a long term. Uh, I have study leave as well. <laughs> study leave and extend and extend. But that was basically to look at new understandings of learners and learning. Yeah. My background is that I set up my own uh, research group called Translational Chemical Biology. Now, the reason I set that research group up was because I am, I'm actually trained in kinesiology. I'm a sports scientist. All my PhD, my undergrad, my master's, my PhD is all to do with sports science. Mathematical modelling of aerobic and anaerobic profiles. I started working inflammation and exercise and fish oils. And my big question was why and how and understanding what's going on as opposed to simply ex accepting what's going on. So I set my own research group up in order to understand how my, my work in fish oils is, is actually occurring. But I couldn't do that alone. So my translational research group involves synthetic chemists, it involves analytical chemists, it involves geneticists, physiologists, molecular biologists, it nutritionists, it involves a lot of different people bringing different things to the table. And we argue on a regular basis about what we're bringing to the table and why. One of the things I find with, my, with the analytical chemists is that they have lots of analytical processes, but they have very few applications for it. And one of the applications I saw is biosocial education. Understanding a bit more. Applying the science that we do have to a setting which has not been applied to before. So Deb's 18 months or so was spent actually exploring these ideas. What I bring to the table is that biological molecular science application and then hopefully together we end up bringing that together into an environment where we can engage with a larger audience and to see how it actually fits together. This means working across different domains. Now, in the biological sciences, it is, it is now standard practice that the only way to be successful is to become very, very finite, very, very small detail. Forget the big picture, smaller and smaller and smaller detail. It used to be physiology of the whole body, then it became organ systems, then it became the organ, then it became the tissue in the organ, then it was the cells talking to each other inside that, then it was subcellular, then it was transcriptional and translational DNA, then it's the genomic work, and it got smaller and smaller and smaller, further and further away. Yeah? So all the different sciences we have, whether it's molecular biology, 
uh, whether neuroscience, analytical chemistry, epigenetics, it was all small, small detail. Yeah? And it was isolated from all other areas. So for the translational chemical biology research group, I'm trying to expand those areas to talk to each other. Which leads very nicely, from my perspective, into engaging with the social sciences, the sociology education, yeah. the political theory, the, the gender studies, the feminist studies, yeah, and engaging with them as well. Because it is n none of these exist in isolation. Yeah. They can't do. We may study them in isolation, and I, I fully propose that we do study them in very fine detail in isolation, but then they must, there must be an application, there must be an extension, there must be growth to that to allow us to understand. So on that basis, <coughs> we move beyond individual areas of study, we move beyond subject specialism, and we engage in translating work. And I think one of the things that we've been talking about is that we started off um, having conversations about doing interdisciplinary work and those conversations turned into conversations about trans domain, that somehow thinking about <laughs> interdisciplinarity didn't capture quite what we were trying to do because the, we were, we were, what was being unsettled was, discipline, was our disciplinary relocations themselves. And so thinking about it in terms of domains of knowledge started to make more, started to make more sense to us. So um, for me, um, and thinking in particular about what, what the people who've invited us here um, are thinking about, part of my move to do this work has come in, in part from conversations that, that Martin and I have, have, have been having. At the same time as I was reading um, work in the new materialist um, domain and thinking about what that does and doesn't do to the sort of critical uh, post-structural sociology of education that I was engaged in. Um, and on the one hand, I would get very frustrated with a new materialist claim to an engagement with materiality that was, was accused to be lacking in prior work um, and think about traditions of school ethnography which, you know, going back sort of 50 years at least, have, are, are very attuned to the, the significance of objects, the significance of rituals, the significance of things. Um, and, and similarly for me, um, it, it would be a misreading of Judith Butler to say that she's only interested in discourse. So on the one hand, a great frustration with new materialism. At the same time, a recognition that in particular, I think for me, Deleuze's um, work on assemblage or, or arrangement alerts us in a, in a new way, in a fresh way, to the significance of all of those sorts of factors and the way that multiple multiple um, influences converge and interact. Um, so so I, I, I like, I find useful Barad's idea about phenomena and Bennett's work on, on the vitality of things. Um, Elizabeth Wilson's gut feminism also I found really useful. And Nicholas Rose's um, recent pa paper about, the, I think it's 2013 paper, about the um, the human sciences in a biological age, and he talks about this biological age. And I wonder from that, and, it, and, and he says, in the social sciences, we absolutely can't afford to ignore the biosciences. Um, if we do so, we'll just find ourselves in a little corner speaking to ourselves, um, speaking amongst ourselves. And I recognise that, and I think that from the conversations that Martin and I have been having, um, I, had a, I had a sense that... It may, not, it, it may not be that it's, it may be at a kind of a, a policy level, it's a biological age, but that might not be, um, that might not be to, to figure the moment that we're in uh, accurately. And, and in conversation, Martin said, but we are biosocial. We're talking about the biological and the social, and he said, but we're biosocial. And of course, of course we're biosocial. And the idea that we are either social or biological seems to be absurd the minute you say it. Uh, and yet, sociology has proceeded as if we are simply social. 
and biology is preceded as though we are not just that we're biological, but that we are we become we become the focus of cellular action. And so this this challenge to say what does it mean to attend to the biosocial and engage that and do that with an eye to education. Um, and so that it's those entanglements that we wanted to explore. Um, and some of those some of those criticisms of where um, feminist studies and where sociology of education got to had been part of my, uh, my sort of driving motivation to do that. Or... <coughs> Did I just miss a slide? Mm -hmm. No. There we go. So in trying to work through this idea of biosocial thinking um, I go to a range I go to a range of places and um, as I said the idea of degrounding in Judith Butler strangely keeps being a really useful place to to to, to go to um, in order to think about this the productive forces of complex social formations if learning is a complex social formation then what are the productive forces uh, that are involved in, in the production of learning. I found Elizabeth Wilson, as I said, her, her work really useful. Uh, she talks about um, this mutual rough and tumble that we might find when we work across the biological and the social. And, she's, um, and she, she says, let's try and get over this sceptic versus enthusiast model that often gets figured as the relationship between the biological and the social. Um, I've become the, the enthusiast, and some of my critical sociology education friends who are long-standing sceptics worry about me. Um, <laughs> they, they do. They do. They worry about me. Um, and they, they worry about me, and they worry about what, what might happen if I pursue this work, and they worry about what might happen what might be done with the work that we might do. And they worry about, um, they worry about what might happen if we promote different emerging forms of biological knowledge um, when the policymakers get their hands on it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, one of the things that, that we've discussed in, in this suspension of the skeptic versus enthusiast approach is to, is, Suspending that worry about what happens when the policymakers get their hands on it, not to ignore the genu that genuine worry, but to to do the scholarship, to do the scholarship, not, to not be prevented from doing the scholarly work and doing the research because we were worried about what the a policy might, policy maker or a policy lobby might do with that down the line. Um, so one of the things that I've been surprised about is the level of antipathy towards myself as a biological scientist. <laughs> I'm, used to be, I'm used to standing up in front of large audiences and having discussions, and it may be a heated discussion about a certain point, but it will be, always be an open discussion, and there may be a, a them and us camp, as it were. But for my, my involvement so far in the social sciences is that there's an open door to talk, but there's obviously camps that were people are positioned in, and the questions that come from the audience end, end up being from that position. I am in this position, this is my thought processes, and therefore everything I do and interpret comes from that standpoint, and I'm not willing to, to deviate from that. Uh, and it may be that there's a large concern for what happens with the biological knowledge that we create. Mm -hmm. Now, from my biological background, we, we could be accused of being uh, naive in not thinking about the consequences of pursuit of our knowledge and that we pursue it blindly and alley regardless of what anybody else will do with our knowledge. And I think what I'm trying to posit is that there is a middle position. There is a balanced position whereby you don't close the door to opening new knowledges, but you have an appreciation and acceptance that you need to understand that there, there, there is a consequence of that knowledge but if we don't engage, then we will never know what that consequence could possibly be, and we couldn't stave off the negative consequences. One of the things I see in the readings I have on the uh, political 
agendas and the education policies is there is bioscience in there. There's quite a lot of bioscience in there. And from my perspective, it's pretty bad bioscience. <laughs> and from my position, there's claims in there which are biologically unsound claims. But could that be because there's, there's a limited biosocial interaction for those discussions to take place? They're, they're almost unchecked. They're, they're, they're not unchecked or unchallenged. They're unchecked and unchallenged by other biologists. They may be checked and challenged by sociologists, but then your opinion gets brushed aside because you're not biologists. Whereas if the engagement occurs, then there's a discourse to be had with or trans domain so that we can actually understand what is going on. So, so I, I, I like this idea from Elizabeth Wilson about a, a, a systemic traffic in disquiet that can't quite be grasped. And I think that what we find ourselves doing is, is engaging in this traffic in disquiet. Um, and one of the things that I think that, certainly for me, that I become aware of is um, the, positions that I, the, the positions that I am very protective of and that I defend. Um, and how, uh, what it means then to be open to the sort of concept transformation or metamorphosis um, that Malibu talks about. So um, I was talking at the Institute of Education in London recently and somebody in the audience read a piece out of um, School Trouble at me <laughs> and said, but let me just go to page 46. I'm going, oh my goodness, what's happening here? And what they, um, what they had was a little, a, a little um, citation where I say that special education needs are wholly discursively constructed. And they said, so do you, will you still hold that? And I have to say, given the work that we're currently doing, I, have, I, I am challenged then to hold that claim in abeyance. And for people here who, are, who do inclusive education, like, what? <coughs> what am I talking about? I'm like actually saying that maybe I'm about to say that special education needs might be real. Like, can you believe that I'm saying that? Should we um, turn off the video? <laughs> 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 it's, I, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of that bad, right? It's, it's such a, um, it's so heretical to say that in critical disability studies or inclusive education. And yet, as I'm talking about engaging in this encounter across disciplines, if we're going to do it, I have to at least be willing to experience that degrounding and say, you know what, maybe, maybe to say that that's wholly discursively constituted, I have to say that I can't stand by that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of those moments where um, the, the challenge then is what a, what am I going to do with that space? Um, and the, the, piece that, um, the piece that we've been working on like this last, last week or so has been looking at ADHD. So to, to really push that point, if I've said um, special needs are discursively constitu constituted, you know, and I join in with people like Roger Slee and Julie Allen and Valerie Harwood, you know, dear friends, and I'll say, no, there's no such thing as ADHD. And then we start getting out the... Um, the the bio and the neuroscience evidence, um, and where do, where does that then leave us? Because it's not, to, it, and it's not to say that then we jettison the very powerful readings from inclusive education or disability studies, but to say what happens when you put these different forms of evidence alongside each other, um, and what what kind of accounts then do we do we end up with? Um, but it's, it's, it's both sides that have this realisation. The very, not very long ago, hardcore biological scientists, genetics and everything. Then we, we, we read the entire genome and went, oh, that doesn't explain everything. <laughs> ah. And then we said, well, obviously there's no impact of, of social interaction on genetics or physiology or biochemistry. And then we discovered epigenetics and we say, look, there is an impact of social. So the biological scientists are having to go through the same process. They may not want to admit it. It may, it may not be discussed as openly as it should do. And that's why this forum, I think, is a good forum to have. Because we have both sides 
of the divide, almost, trying to cross it. But it's who gives up what in order to make that step across. And I think what we're trying to say is that both sides have to engage and not give away their standpoints, but to lighten the grip on that standpoint. <laughs> lightening the grip. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with having a, 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 that, that, that hold as long as you're prepared to see how it fits with everything else. One of the things that um, make, makes us feel um, positive about, or, or, or optimistic about this is the way that um, ideas about porosity and plasticity are central across both fields. And so, um, if, we, if we're going to allow big crude fields like bio and, and social, so whether it's Samantha Frost's work on um, biocultural creatures, Malibu's work around trans plasticity and transformability, or epigenetics, human microbiome project, what we have are accounts of plasticity, of the, the movability, of the non-fixedness of the subject and the body. And that gives us a space to, um, that gives us a space to start talking about productive forces across social and biological factors, across social and biological influences. Do you want to say anything? Well, I mean, are we, all, are we fully aware of epigenetics? Mm -hmm. Do we know what epigenetics mm -hmm. is? No. So we have some slides later on, we'll go into a bit more detail. But essentially, the epigenetics is changes on your genetic code, which are not to do with your traditional form-based pairs. So your, 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 uh, your alphabet of your genetic code stays the same, but there's alterations that occur on that alphabet. Okay? And that can occur via an environmental stimuli. So uh, the biggest one is, is obvious is smoking. There's a lot of work done that demonstrates that if you smoke, then you'll have a massive impact on your genetic code and your methylation status. But I've done work recently where I've done exercise and seen a, a temporary methylation change due to exercise. Uh, and the, the, the interesting step I made with that is I did that with some sports psychologists who were looking at motivational status, why people do the exercise. And what we found is that depending on why you do the exercise, the same exercise bout will have a differential effect upon your genetic status. So your, ep your epigenetic changes will change based upon why you're doing the exercise. I exercise because I enjoy it. But for every one of me, there's somebody else that hates doing it, but knows they should do it. And we're seeing different physiological biochemical changes occurring because of that, which says we are biosocial. It says there is an integration. But we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Just if you use the term methylation, to explain that. So, so I'm, right, I'm we, in, we, we have some slides here. Let's, let's, let's go out of order. Yeah. So, the, oh, wrong slide. I'm, I'm trying to you, do You start talking, I'll find you. I'm using the ones that I can see. There we go. There you go. So, this is a, um, a schematic for, of, for methylation. So this is, this is showing how gene regulation and expression is affected by environmental factors. Um, it's a, it's a um, free open source image that you can, you can get quite easily. So up on the, the top corner there where you see the X of the, the chromosome, there's a list of environmental influences. Can you see the list at the back? So, okay, so development in utero and during childhood, environmental chemicals, drugs, pharmaceuticals, aging, diet. So in this schematic, that environmental gets reduced to uh, five bullet points. And of course, for social scientists, those five bullet points, are that, that's incredibly crude and blunt and needs massively expanding. But what's the schematic show is suggesting is that the things that go into those bullet points, which we understand to be incredibly complex social processes with institutional policy influence and so on, those incredibly complicated processes affect the way that the the way that the gene is expressed. 
And it, one of the key ways it does that is through methylation. So what we see there, if you see the little blue discs, that the, those are histones and the, the, um, genetic, the genetic material is spooled around them and the accessibility or not of genes is influenced by, by that. And then methyl groups get added and that can, people talk, talk about switching on and switching off, and that's a bit too crude, but methylation can, can limit the expression of a gene, and the, the, limiting, or the limiting of its expression limits whether it, the extent to which it does its job. So when we're looking at um, ADHD literature, lots of, what's, lots of what the um, neurogeneticists are looking at is the way that particular genes involved in serotonin regulation get turned on and dopamine, dopamine regulation get enhanced or, um, or diminished so that, the, so that those are cleared from the system or they're not cleared from the system. They work in slightly different ways. And this, these, are, these are genes that the ADHD genetic neurogeneticists have focused in on. And there are kind of historical reasons about other conditions that make them do that. Does environment, do environmental chemicals include uh, the cortisol and... Uh, oh, the so where they're talking about environmental chemicals there, those are external. Okay, yeah. so does that include... So in utero, would that be affecting the child too? Yes, or yeah. Cortisol? So, so, so from this one, they've got the they're using uh, environmental chemicals, meaning the external, okay. yeah, yeah, and they will have an impact upon uh, the the methylation status of your DNA. However, in all the chemical structures inside the body will also have an impact. So they've done a very gross environmental impact because they they, they can test uh, cigarette smoking, they can see an external environment, they can see the change in the lung, and they can see knock on effect. But there's, there's there's an awful lot more than that. This is, this is reducing it down to some very, very basic gross points. And the biological scientists would have an entire presentation on just one of those, and we talk for hours upon the different levels. Mm -hmm. yeah. But essentially, you have your chromosomes, your DNA, yeah, which will give you your genes. And if you have uh, SNPs, polymorphisms, for one thing or another. People don't know what SNPs and polymorphisms are. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're variations of they're, they're yeah. the ways in which a gene right. genes yeah. vary. Yeah. And sometimes the variation is part of your code, and sometimes the variation is environmentally produced. Mm -hmm. But those variations are what the geneticists look for to see whether this population or that population are being affected by those mm -hmm. those gene variants and their expression. I'm just wondering if a whole generation experiencing something and mm -hmm. having those kinds of similar stresses would be also mm -hmm. expressed mm -hmm. in the genes. That's the reason why I'm asking. Yes, yes. yeah. yeah. I mean, and that, that's one of the, 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 the new areas of study is looking at right. these large impacts uh, and how they do, how the environmental stimuli do have impact upon the genes. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, we have a, a very, you have your DNA, you have your genes, and therefore this happens. Well, that's, that's not the case. We have genes, we have the gene expression, and we have the protein expression. So there's lots of different steps in that before we actually get a final outcome. And what we're finding here is what the, the methylation status of the epigenetics, so histone modification and chromatin modification, that's giving us another uh, regulatory level of understanding. You're saying then that the effects are not determined, though. They're indeterminate effects, and if there are effects, they can be re reversed, like through, I don't know, well, exercise um, or... We, we, they're, they're very, the effects of it, smoking is the example. Right. Yeah? We can find changes in your methylation status due to smoking, right. uh, and when you stop smoking, then they will gradually decline. Those methylation changes will reverse. Mm -hmm. However, the damage that's been done because of those changes won't get reversed. So the algae, so the physiology change, the alveoli in your lungs were the, the chemicals and the breakdown of the walls and therefore the breakdown of your ability to have oxygen exchange across the membranes, that's a physical change which will remain. But that has been brought about because of some of the biochemistry that was brought about because of the epigenetics.
and the, the, you will have a bigger or a smaller impact depending on your genes. Mm -hmm. So it's a multi-level process. So, so one of the, um, your, your question makes me think of one of the areas that's been really contentious in, in sociology of education and, and family welfare has been around early adversity and stress and what that does. Um, and you know, one of the things we have to start off saying is we're looking at, at this, we're, we're looking at animal models and, at, and what's happening in rats is then being extrapolated to humans. So that those are the moves that are being made, but work around early adversity and stress in model animals suggests epigenetic changes that have implications for um, for um, res the way that stress response chemicals are regulated and cleared from the system, um, and on sociality, on cognitive function. But they're also the, in the animal models. They also show that those are reversible, and that when you sh when you change the environment, you change the way in which the genes are expressed and, and the way that the body the body is functioning. And it's that sense of plasticity that we were talking about earlier. That's why this feels like an important place to go as a as a sociologist of education. We've had a period of of policy in the UK where there's been this insistence on the first thousand days of life, two is too late, um, we have to intervene in poor parenting really early. And uh, there's all sorts of things that we need to say about those sorts of policy trajectories, what this work on gene expression and regulation around early adversity also suggests is that two isn't too late and that it's not if we get to day 1002, we don't need to write the kid off. Um, and that to me is really important as a sociologist who's always been concerned with the reproduction of inequality in education. Mm -hmm. So and, and that's, that's really where I think the, the integration of the bio and the social must come together and the importance of it. Because there is, there is a policy in place which says a thousand days, two years too late. Well, there's bioevidence to demonstrate the plasticity. There's bioevidence to suggest that there are, there are other mitigating factors. There's bioevidence to say that we can change things. So if we engage in that bio and the social together, then policies that are contentious can be challenged. And can be, we can revert and we can change educational policy based on challenges to what's been put in place, but from an evidential background. Uh, one of the one of the, we'll get to, we're so off script it doesn't matter. Um, one of the, one of the things that we then find ourselves um, discussing vigorously is the argument. Is, the argument <laughs> in, 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 is that kind of um, is is that move Martin talks about evidence, and we've got some evidence, and I get um, I I get annoyed. Because what I don't want to say is that I had all of these positions as a critical soci sociologist um, and policymakers have been ignoring them and, you know, and the education machine has marched on and now I have to go and find my, my friends, my, you know, my molecular biology friends and his friends who are analytical chemists and make friends with neuroscientists and then they can help me out because they've got some real evidence. And that is, that, that's really, again, you know, it's really discomforting and I absolutely don't want to say that critical sociology hasn't had good evidence. I think we've had some fantastic evidence that's been ignored. If we, have a, if we have a policy regime that loves science, let's be strategic and give them some science evidence, right? If they love it, let's give them some. Uh, and, the, and the other thing, the other thing is that it may be that in bringing different forms of evidence together, actually we, we, it, we, we discover that what we know, we know something different. So we've been doing work, we, we wrote a paper recently, the two of us with Valerie Harwood, on stress and one of the things that we one, one of the things that that then pushes us to consider is a much more nuanced way of thinking about stress so you know the, the newspapers around testing time are full of hysteria about you know these children's eyelashes are falling out and they can't sleep and it's dreadful and I don't want my kids to do these tests either so it's not like I you know I, I don't love the tests but 
actually it might be that as we as we piece together evidence from across different different domains using different techniques we'll find a more a more differentiated story about about stress and actually stress might turn out to not be the right word and that we're talking about different sorts of phenomena and different sorts of phenomena for different children and so the, an openness to those possibilities as well. Um, some, of the, some of the work that uh, I'm doing separate from biosocial is becoming biosocial and that I work yeah. with an, an executive productivity laboratory which is a lot of the university enterprise space and they're beginning to take contracts to go into big business so the multi-trillion dollar industries of banking yeah. and they want us to start looking at their executives and work out how they perform and why because they've realised all the psychometric testing and all the analysis and all of this is this is that this is the it doesn't work and they know it doesn't work and they're now prepared to do something about it so I'm, I've been invited down into London into the headquarters of one of the major banks and we're going to take a mass spectrometer and we're going to start measuring we're going to stress out people doing psychometric tests and we're going to start measuring people to see what we find. But they're adamant that they need something more, they're not happy with their performance, and they're not happy with what's currently being used. Now, I, I, I saw, saw that as being distinct and separate, and that's just my bio going on. And, do, and I'm thinking, well, actually, there, could, there, there, can, there are connections, there are ways to do What if there is some way in which we can demonstrate that the stress from the test is negatively impacting learning? Would that change the fact that they're doing the tests? And how would that change it? I don't know, but I think it's worth the discussion. So, go back a little while. So, um, <coughs> we were going to talk about understanding the materiality of learning. Um, and one of the, uh, one of the things that, um, for social scientists or sociologists of education, these sorts of questions about the materiality of learning and what bodies do or can do and what bodies feel and the flows of feeling and what things do and foreclose are quite recognisable um, feminist sociology of education, new materials sort of questions. Um, and one of the frustrations for me of those questions, and they're questions that I've been wanting to ask, one of the frustrations is, for me, they have a really limited capacity to speak to the biological processes involved in the in learning and in the production of the feelings that are part of learning, so we can we we speak to we speak to bodies and we speak to feeling without being able to say anything about the biochemistry that provokes those provokes those feelings or the the cellular and molecular functions involved. So a quick a quick. Um, a quick tour of Anna Hikimudi. Um, I really like her work on feeling, this paper in particular. She makes this distinction between affect as affection and affect in, in her work on effective pedagogy. And she talks about affect as this, this place between affection and affectus, which moves us, which is a visceral prompt. And this idea of a visceral prompt really um, distills for me the, the thing that I've been wanting to be able to speak to, which I've needed collaborators in other fields in order to speak to. What, it, what is that visceral prompt? How do, we, how do we understand it? How do we recognise it? How do we, even, how do we even know that such a visceral prompt is involved? And what does that visceral prompt make possible? What does it insist upon? What might we, what, what might we do with it? So this takes me um, this takes me back to this piece of data um, that's in a piece by me and Jane Kenway from 2011 in Emotion Space Society, which is ethnographic data um, in from a study in a school for boys diagnosed as having social emotional behavioural difficulties, and I talk about this school in in the book School Trouble. And this is a moment where I'm leaving the school and I see this kid 
running away from teachers across the, across the lawn at the front of the school. Um, and I'm drawn to it and I watch. So I see these teachers running. Um, so I notice two teachers moving at a scurry's pace along the drive in front of me. Moving faster, they slip between two trees and onto the little used expanse of playing field beyond. I crawl on in my car, pausing at gaps in the trees to watch as the teachers break into a slow run, calling out as they go. I scan the shaded grass in front of them, looking for the object of their pursuit. I spot a small, fair, cropped-haired boy, perhaps 12 years old, running in the direction of the school's perimeter, along which mature trees are interspersed with low and sparse immature shrubs. I smile inwardly as I watch the teachers flag in, slowing to a defeated adult pace jog, jog come walk, while the boy drops long leaps and high jumps into his easy running. <laughs> I crawl to the junction with the road as the boy makes the trees in the shrub line, but instead of breaching it, which an easy charge through the gaps in the shrubbery would achieve, he turns hard left and continues to run full pelt along the trajectory that tracks a line just inside the school perimeter. In my rearview mirror, I see the teachers change direction, now simply walking. They head diagonally across the field towards a point where their trajectory and the boys might intersect. I drive home, made exhilarated and sad by the boys running the line. So in, so in the paper with, with Jane, I write about this moment and I call up the affectivities of the event and try to work through the way that feeling is in play here and is significant. And although I love the data and I'm quite happy with the paper, um, I'm also really ultimately disappointed because I can't actually say anything except for my own projections. You know, it's, it's me who says that the teachers are, you know, I, Martin points out to me, I, I, I realise we were laughing about this yesterday, you know, that I, I make the teachers maybe just a tiny bit more ridiculous than they were at the moment. Um, and the boys, the boys, the, the joy of the boys' high leaps, are perhaps mine, not his. Um, and I can't, I can't speak to the, whether this was jouissance or the productive force of desire or, or a terrified boy who's running from something dreadful that's happened that he can't cope with. Um, and it's probably more likely that it's that one than jouissance, given the set setting that we're in. But the point, is, the point is I can't know, and I'm frustrated that I'm not able to say what the effective flows here are. And I want to know because I think that understanding that might enable us to intervene in settings like this in ways that make them much better for the children who are in them, or might enable us to make different sorts of cases for the non-existence of settings like this. So, so I come back to that to find, really just to come up against the limit of, um, the limit of what I can do. So at the moment Martin and I are just waiting on outcome from the UK's Economic and Social Research Council for a study on feeling in the classroom where we're going to put together the, my sort of ethnography with some of the work that he and his colleagues do in the, in the Translational Chemical Biology Research Group to try and answer some of those questions or respond to that frustration for the, the things that we can't say about that sort of moment. Um, and to think about how we, to think about the processes in play biochemically and discursively and effectively so it's absolutely not about saying, I just need your biochemistry. It's about saying what, what happens when we understand across those sorts of, across those sorts of registers. Um, we talked about that already. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you think I'll get to the end of the session and I'll have remembered? So we, we looked there. This was really just to... Um, We'd had the schematic, and that was just really to have a sense of what you actually see. So with, with very, very powerful microscopy, what you, what you actually see when you look at the chromosome. Because the schematic, in some ways, um, misleads us 
it's still what we what we're looking at. This this is a, a debate and a discussion that I've had with them quite a lot, which is about the the acceptance of schematics and representations in the biosciences, mm -hmm. and how an awful lot of the images that I gave there to say to explain things. She's saying, well, is this the real thing, or is this an interpretation by the scientist? And I'm all, it's the real thing. It's his interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> it's like. Okay, right, so we need actual images. Okay. Now, I mean, one of the things I, I come back to in my own personal reflections on this is uh, uh, Zen's Buddhist saying, which is about the tea. It's like, how do you find out how the tea tastes? It's like, you taste it. <laughs> taste the tea. Don't ask me how the tea tastes. Don't, don't think about how the tea tastes the tea. That is, tea tastes differently for everybody. So, actually having the tea to look at <laughs> means that each individual can taste the tea, uh, as opposed to the, the huge numbers of schematic representations and uh, images that portray something from the biosciences. Uh, the moving images, uh, we've gone through TED Talks, we've gone through various different YouTube channels of education, all about explaining uh, biochemical processes in the body. And at times I get confused what I'm looking at. Is this an actual representation of a molecular motor? Or is this a cartoon that they put together? <laughs> and if I can't differentiate that, being a molecular scientist, <laughs> then I'm pretty sure other people can't either, and we end up not knowing what we are looking at. Mm -hmm. So the schematic for the methylation status, I could read all that differently, and it may give a different interpretation. And the images that we have of our chromosomes give you zero interpretation, because they're just smudges on the paper, and they don't give us that much of an idea. So, so those are images of um, histone modification, so the histones are the blue spools that the, uh, that the DNA is wrapped around in inside the, chro the chromatin that the DNA is in, wrapped around inside the chromosome, and these are really, really high magnification images, so the top is the actual cell. That we're looking at the same thing, but we're looking at it by different images. So we've got a confocal microscope, and we're looking at, uh, we've got some fluorescence going on as opposed to a light microscope. So we're looking at the same thing and getting different images. We can manipulate the actual uh, sample to see different things. And our interpretations of what we see are predetermined based upon what we've actually done to the sample and to see what's coming on. And that interpretation is what we need to be, as a bioscientist, I need to be aware of and how it goes. So when, we're, so when we're talking about researching feeling in the classroom and the relationship between feeling and learning and the part that feeling plays in learning, one of the things that we want to attend to are the potential for different sorts of methylation and what they will make possible or what they might start to render more difficult. Um, this is uh, EEG brain imaging, so there's a, the, a cap with sensors on and it looks at the um, electrical activity in the brain and this is a study that looks at um, emotion by having people look at film clips. Now these are laboratory based studies using films but what they're showing at different um, bandwidths of electrical activity within the brain, different sorts of pa patterns of connectivity that they suggest can then correlate with different sorts of emotional states. So we're interested what would happen if we used that, an application of that in a classroom. Exhale breath analysis is something that Martin and his colleagues in the TCRB are um, engaged in. So this is um, a paper by one of Martin's colleagues, Matt Turner, and they've given, they've done exhaled breath analysis with school-aged kids before and after doing tests. And there's a, it's a, it uses a standard psych model that some of us might be quite, com, com, quite uncomfortable with. You know, it's a bit, it's a bit laboratory brain based. It doesn't have any ethnographic richness, but the, but the, the children know they're doing a test and it's, they add stress by telling the children that the results will be publicly posted, and it's a standard, um, it's a standard stress model, test, stress testing model that gets used in in the field. 
So what's novel here, and that's not what um, Matt Turner is a um, is an analytic chemist. He's not a psychologist who does testing. He, what he's do doing is using that model to to apply the analysis of exhaled breath. And what his exhaled breath analysis shows are peaks in particular sorts of compounds in the breath that suggests that the children are really stressed out by the test. Now, on the one hand, we would say, well, we knew that they were stressed out by the test and we didn't need to get them to blow into the <laughs> little thing to know that they found the test stressful. But the point is that we can demonstrate another layer. It's another layer of de demonstration of the stress. It also allows us to start to differentiate different sorts of responses amongst different children. So not every child was stressed by the test. And what are the different kinds of compounds that appear for different children and what might be the implications of those? One of the um, arguments that we enjoy having is around personalization and what personalization might mean in medicine and what it might mean in education and how personalization become in education becomes um, hierarchical sorting by another name and just a, a, another vehicle through which kids that are you know, used to schools get siphoned out. So my immediate critical sociology of education, um, I throw my hands up in horror, don't I? And then just have to start thinking, okay, well, if in, in, a, different, if in, in a different framework, um, what might it be able to do usefully? So that's, that's um, Matt's work. One of the applications we see for I see from this is that if we are starting to look at uh, biochemical pro profiles of volatile organic compounds in exhaled breath and how it matches stress, how we already define stress or stress behaviour, are we, are we differentiating? If we can establish that these chemical profiles indicate a biochemical process in the body which we are defining as stress, what happens to the individuals that don't exhibit behaviour patterns of being stressed, but internally are stressed. Mm -hmm. And can, can, can it therefore our, allow us to help that process of understanding? Mm -hmm. So these are, um, these are measures that are taken from individual children before and after the test. This work um, by Williams is in a cinema auditorium, so he's taking atmospheric samples. And so we're thinking about atmospheric samples in classrooms. And what this shows is a patterned response. So they, they use the same cinema auditorium over a long period of time with different sorts of film screening. They coded the film screening. Again, the sort of ethnographers might get really frustrated with the way in which the, the films get coded and find it a bit crude and stuff. But all the same, how, you know, whatever those critiques might be, the patterned responses are, are, are quite powerful and, and remain. And so these are findings from uh, yeah, a really scary bit in Hunger Games too. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and this is what the data looks like. So it's, and it's processed through the computer. It doesn't get stored as human tissue, which is another reason why we like it for schools, because the, um, the breath sample gets run through the kit and dissipates. So there's no human tissue issues, which, there, which might be problematic for schools. Um, one, one of the things with, with this patterning that we're doing, it's, it's used in a very uh, laboratory, practical, single setting, looking at samples and therapy. Our idea is to use this as a, they've used it in a cinema auditorium, if we can use it in a classroom, and we can start looking at these profiles, great, the analytic chemist and the biochemist, we can start looking at those profiles. But as the ethnographers amongst us are concerned about how it's been uh, recorded, if we can work as an ethnographer and match up some quality ethnographer data with this, then we can put them together. And we've got various different scenarios in, in the classroom whereby we do individual children at different times. Uh, we know that nutrition has an impact on the body, therefore we'd be doing it before and after lunch. We know that physical activity has an impact on the body, so we do it before and after recess. Yeah. But we can also do an ethnographer study where we're looking at what's happening and seeing if we can match up different profiles to so, understand yeah. what's happening. So, so methodologically, it would mean, I, I think it means ethnography, which is intensely attentive to time, 
so that it can be so that it can be tied up and it probably means video recording classrooms at the same time as having ethnographers in situ so that you can be very precise about what's happening in the atmosphere at the in correspondence with what's happening as the, as the ethnographer observes it one of the other things although the, these um, these pieces we've pulled out are around stress I'm much more interested in happiness and would really like to know what happens in classrooms that makes kids feel happy, joyful. What does what happens what happens then? I mean, I, I would like to be able to I'd like to be able to use this to help make further cases around the sorts of relationships that teachers might have with students and the sorts of the sorts of effective effective environments that classrooms might be able to be. So. And the, the, the this, this is something that is unique. This is something that's not happening in biosciences. So we're, we're looking at stress, we're looking at effect of this, that and the other. Uh, recently I put a grant into NASA where we're looking at mass spectrometry on Mars missions, looking at how we look at the astronauts' physical state as they, as they go through their five-year journey to Mars and back again, etc. I mean, and that's with the, the leading mass spectrometers and the experts in the field from the states. But nobody's talking about how they feel. Which on a five-year trip to Mars becomes vitally important to the, to the professional functioning of that unit, that group of people in a confined space for a five to ten year process there, but whatever else. Then, then all the nuances of the social sciences become vitally important to the success. I mean, and NASA are starting to engage with that type of thinking, but they're a long way off it. And what the work here we're proposing is really hitting that, that least that, that, that trying to get at stuff that's not been looked at at all before. Now, whether it's not been looked at because the biosciences don't think it's important, or whether they've never thought about it, or whether it's been too complicated, certainly the biosciences have no knowledge of how to think about feelings. Which is why I need to engage with people who do. Or, or they think about feelings as hormones or compounds or neurotransmitters, um, but they they think they think about those separated from a human person in a real social setting, and so it's the it's bringing those relationships back back together. It, it's sort of in some ways to so social scientists it seems. It seems crazy to be thinking about a neurotransmitter without thinking about a person. Um, but it's the nuance of that relationship. So we then um, say, what, what happens if we go back to that data of the, of the boy running from the teachers mm -hmm. and think about it biosocially? What else would we know about the affective flows and what a body can do? What's possible for the, for the teacher and for the child in the situation? Um, and what happens to our, con our concepts like feeling and affectus and aff affect and learning and disorder and stress and happiness, contentment, what happens to all of those sorts of ideas if we work biosocially? Okay, so we're, su we're, um, we're summarising. So, this attempt to do to think biosocially in education is about paying attention simultaneously to the biological and the sociological. And what we're what we're suggesting is it's not just the case that these biological and social processes and mechanisms exist at the same time, but that they're unfolded together. They're in a they're in a dynamic relationship. Um, and that it's in that dynamic relationship that they produce a phenomena such as learning, mm -hmm. and that that's why we need to we need to do the collaborative work to understand the nature of that enfoldedness. So our understanding of the production and the products of learning becomes simultaneously concerned with things like it's not an exhaustive list, but social structures, institutional practices, representation and meaning, subjectivities, relationships, feelings. Also, neural networks, metabolic processes, molecular functions. This work that we um, spoke about earlier, that 
Martin and I have done with Valerie Harwood around the languages of stress in schools. What we want to, what we explored there is the way that we get an expanded understanding of what it means to talk about stress and stress in school if we approach it biosocially. Um, what its longer term implications might be, what we might need to do differently as institutions, why stress might be a problem. So we're saying that biosocial ethnography has, has the potential to give us new insights into education phenomena, um, how feelings throw, flow through education systems and settings and people and pedagogies, um, and what the productive force and effects of feeling and learning in classrooms are on the wrong slide, thanks. <laughs> it made us uh, listen to you better. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Instead of reading us. So it gives us access to these, it gives us access to these further lines of insight um, and the convergence and interaction of biological and social processes. And we want to suggest that what that has the potential to do is enable us to understand an assemblage of learning in a way that we currently just simply don't understand it. We're done. questions in the interview, um, or you can you know, leave if you need to at that point. But for now, why don't we just open the floor to questions from this really interesting presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. One of the things I've been wondering about, because Martin, you said several times, does this have an impact on that? And I was wondering, Deborah, if, if the dismissing of cause and effect in new materialism is another one of the things that makes you crazy. It is another thing that makes you crazy. <laughs> and I think that the, um, the, that dismissal and the kind of a broader social science or so, critical sociology um, avoidance of causality and the systems on on nuance and complexity and situatedness such that we then don't speak about causality at all becomes a problem. So we start talking about multifactorial complex causality um, and, and that's really what we want to be able to talk about. And I think that when we speak about um, the sorts of how questions about social processes, actually we do want to know that something makes something happen. Um, but we won't, but we, we, as social scientists or sociologists, we won't use the word causality. One of the things, though, that Martin has um, talked about is that actually causality is often absent in bioscience research, and that bioscience research itself needs to be really careful about claims to causality, and often that's not what we're being offered. We, we have a, a huge issue in the biosciences of. <coughs> correlation and relationships mm -hmm. and the assumption of causality without any uh, rational reason or evidence to support it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a continual battle within biosciences is to look at cause and effect, look at causality and look at relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, biosciences has grown enormously because of technological advancement. Mm -hmm. What hasn't grown at the same pace as the technological advancement is the ability to analyse the data we're producing. So I now sit on vast arrays of data and I have no idea what it means or even how to investigate or analyse what it means. So one of my collaborations with my uh, research group now is I've now brought in a mathematical uh, statistical uh, group. So I now, I'm now supervising a PhD student in statistics. 
not because I have any knowledge of statistics, but I have a desire to understand what I'm doing. So I brought in teams, and I'm now crossing a domain that other uh, bioscientists don't don't actually cross. Maybe if you got somebody from Google, they would help. They would help. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, 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 a, there's a lot of different mathematical algorithms going around, which, yeah. which uh, there's an awful lot of information out there. Uh, but it, but in, until we start talking to each other in the different realms to help us understand them, we're never going to get to a cause and effect. And, and causality, I mean, it's a, it's a really important problem because in the, in post the human genome and the realisation that, that causation, genetic causation is really, really complicated or is not explained by mapping the genome as has been anticipated, one of the things that's emerged is genome-wide association studies. So they take very large, they take large population samples and quite large they're not complete genomes, but they, they're large arrays of genetic information, and they do massive correlations across them. And what the, the principle is that many genes will have small effects and they'll work together to create a trait, e.g. ADHD. So, and, um, but what they're not doing is demonstrating a mechanism. So Martin likes mechanisms, mm -hmm. and a genome-wide association study doesn't give you a mechanism. What it gives you is really complicated, sophisticated correlations, which the people who use them will want to say they're as good as a mechanism, but they're not a mechanism. And those, those, so that sort of problem exists alongside a problem where social science has, um, has pushed aside questions of causality as it's pushed, you know, in its move of disgust against science, it push aside, pushes aside causality, but actually I do want to know what makes it possible for a child to learn. And I want to know what makes it, what forecloses the possibility of learning for a child, and that might be different for different child, so it might force me to think about personalisation when I, my impulse as a critical sociologist sends me screaming, no, it's just another form of setting viability, um, or another excuse to do that. So, so what cause, what, what makes things happen becomes really pressing. You want to come back? Yeah, I do, but I'll... No, go on, <laughs> Well, yeah. I, I mean, when you say I want to know how a child learns, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, I'm thinking, okay, what, what child under what, what circumstances? Uh, absolutely. What architecture yeah. and all those yeah. other things yeah. that materialism gives us as yeah. concepts that make, make a difference. Yeah. And but, but one of the one of the things I see is that the more we investigate, the more we can understand all of those things. Mm -hmm. we, we can start to understand the environmental impact and the social impact mm -hmm. and the physical impact and the and then start that, then say, okay, what type of what, what environmental setting for what individual has what effect and how can I mean I talk about precision medicine and optimization of health and that is personalization and that is uh, 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 the subject that we have, we have a little barrier there we discuss about, uh, and there's a no, it's like, but, but it's, 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 it's accepted as the correct way in one domain, and it's completely opposite in the other. Well, there must be some type of happy medium where we can use to our best advantage. One, uh, being a bio, bio, biologist, one of my biggest frustrations is the scientific method. Yeah? We, for thousands of years, we've looked at single variables and controlling everything else. Mm -hmm. yeah? And that is how we've made massive advancements in scientific knowledge and study. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, it must be interpreted and applied, and it must be connect connected to what is measuring. And it isn't. It's still now, we still... So we end up with GWA studies, which are the other end of the scale and don't have that mechanistic cause and effect, just have a generic uh, all-seeing, all all-dancing correlation. There must be a middle ground where we can put them together. And that's what I'm looking towards, that middle ground, the balance, the happy medium, the understanding from all the aspects. Yeah, I don't know that it's going to become a happy medium at all, like it might be a really uncomfortable um, place. <laughs> but, but I'm interested, I'm, I'm I'm, that. <laughs> I'm interested in, in, in what, we can, what we can make that. Where are we going? One, two. Okay, in the back. Um, so here is an, yeah. 
Um, to your students. Yeah. Okay. okay, thanks very much. It's very interesting uh, and very, I think, innovative, right, to be pulling on uh, these demands. So, just a couple of questions. One would be what other kinds of pre existing kinds of collaborations? like you that have a kind of critical <coughs> social scientific view and the bioscience view are going on and where you drawing inspirations. And the second thing, so I'm an anthropologist, and when I first <coughs> saw this, I thought immediately of sociobiology, which became this, you know, this huge lightning rod for feminist critique back in the 80s with Nina Wilson and the other guy. So I think that's part of this this huge layer of mm -hmm. kind of stigma mm -hmm. against this that I, mm -hmm. I'm curious if you've tried to kind of wrestle with that history and kind of what that might mean. And I, I feel like you're doing something different, but specifically try to take that on. That might be more of a North American debate than something that was in the UK. I don't know, but... Well, I'll, I'll jump in for the anthropology side of things. I first really got to grips with epigenetics from a human biology perspective, from biological and social anthropologists who wanted to say there was something other than genetics. They wanted to get away from the nature arguments and wanted to get into the nurture debate and they wanted to use the science to demonstrate how and why. So I always thought, you know, get genetics, that's irrelevant, look at the environmental impacts on genes. That's what's real, that's the driving force, not the DNA, not the chromosomes, not the genetics, the social, the environmental impact, that's what's important. And that, that's how I really got first introduced to it 10 uh, odd years ago. So I, I, I've come at it from a different perspective here. I've not come at it from learning the epigenetics and then trying to apply it. I was told, don't do genetics, that's rubbish. Look at the impact of society. And, okay, I, I'm now being challenged, how am I going to, to look at it? And it's really just, it's bubbled along until I've come into the collaboration with Deborah and gone, I can see an application and then I can see how I can work this to actually lose them. Yeah, what, one of the, the, the last bit of your question, um, with the constraint of, of time and what you can do, I kind of parked those debates and tried to say, you know, I'd love to do that, but that's not my project. And one of the things that I found most difficult is prioritising because this has been so enormous and I've had to develop a degree of competence across all of these biosciences and not ignore science and technology studies and what Libertarians are doing and, and kind of historical social biology stuff. So it's been, I mean, that's been really tough. And, you know, I find myself a kind of master of no trade again, which is, you know, frustrating. And I think absolutely what, what's clear to me is that this work needs to be collaborative amongst a whole, a whole team of scholars. The, I mean, the work that I've been reading that I've been really liking, um, I really like Sam, Samantha Frost's work on biocultural creatures. But one of the things with that is, is that she's done that on her own. It's not, it's not a collaboration. She's kind of retrained. She had a fellowship, you know, in the same broad ball, ballpark that I had a fellowship. We've approached it really differently. So for her, she's retrained and done another like two and a half undergraduate degrees. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is kind of you know, a bit of a, um, a rubbish PhD with about seven different PhD supervisors. And it's sort of, you know, it delivers different things. And I think what it's delivered for me is a sense that this has to be collaborative because if you're not doing it in collaboration with, with experts at the forefront of other fields, what you end up doing is keeping, is keeping making um, kind of caricatures of their science instead of actually being at you know, what's, what's emergent in those fields right now, and that's where we need to be engaging. So it has to be collaborative work. Um, but I mean, I've been inspired, like Celia Roberts' work. I really like her work. The work that she's done on um, early puberty, the, there's, a, there's a brazen boldness about the fact that in, in a feminist field, which absolutely despises the the scientists whose work underpins the concern and despises the idea of early onset, early onset puberty, she said, or she was willing to say, you know what, if there are a load of poor black girls who are having different sorts of lives and this biological process is part of that, then as feminists, surely we have to pay attention to that and take that seriously. And actually, in a, in a, by the time we get to the end of her... Um, end of her book, I've, I've just lost the, the title of her, 
um, puberty and crisis. By the time we get to the end of her book, we're like, do you know what? We're talking about three months, and lots of this is hysteria. But she takes the question really, really seriously and works across biological and, and psych and, um, and social literature. And it's that willingness and the, the, willingness to, um, the willingness to attend to questions that our fields have... There are core commitments in our fields that make us not want to attend to that. And we, we shouldn't let that core commitment that's long-standing stop us from doing it. It's, it's something that the bioscience is just getting to grips with collaborative research. <coughs> so I, I got my uh, mini centre of doctoral training with analytical chemists, synthetic chemists, molecular biologists, and all these different people. And the biosciences are starting to say to answer complex questions, we need complex designs, complex teams. And that's only just starting to exist. We still have research councils which say medical research is this, mm -hmm. basic research is that, mm -hmm. and never mm -hmm. between shall meet. And we've had, you know, we've put in really big beds to under humanities and social science schemes, and social science statisticians have reviewed our proposals and said that Martin and the analytic chemists that they're working with don't know how to adequately power their, their work. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, oh, you know, Oh, it's super, super frustrating for me. Um, and you know, and instead of going to one panel, you're paid because you've got neuroscientists in it as well as molecular scientists. Your your proposal goes to three panels, and so you end up with fifteen reviewers, and you're trying to get five out of five on every criteria from every reviewer. You're absolutely stuffed. Um, and so, you know, we're we're working our way through through research councils and major philanthropics and, um, you know, and, and people say, this is absolutely fantastic, this is just what we want to, what we want to do, um, but can we have some proof of concept studies? Well, we just asked you. It almost seems like that as well, in that in a conceptual framework, if, we, if you speak to the UK research councils, then the administrators that are administrating say, this is a wonderful concept which we need to engage with. Mm. But at the science level, at the individual academic level, the, the reviewing, reviewing professors level, <laughs> they say, from my perspective, in my view, they've got the issues. So uh, we, we're still not where we need to be in order for this to actually snowball. So there isn't a landslide of people jumping on this work, mm -hmm. and I don't think there will be mm -hmm. until some major successes have come through the process. I mean, at the moment, we're working with. Um, one of Marty's interns, who's a human biologist, and she's a we're, we're supporting her putting a doctoral studentship application to the Wellcome Trust under the Humanities and Social Science scheme, which is where they, which is where they give um, doctoral studentships to do biosocial work. And one of the things that we, one of the things that we talked to her about is, you know, you're a really accomplished molecular biologist at the moment. Are you sure you want to do this to your career? Um, and, she, and she's really, really super, super keen. We don't really expect them to give her the studentship anyway. But we've, we have, you know, in the last 12 months, we've gone, to, we've gone from asking for two million pounds from the Wellcome Trust to now we're asking them for one PhD student. <laughs> um, but the message is they wanted this, this, this They really, really want to do yeah, this. Yeah. Right. They, it's, you're doing just what we want to be doing. This is where we want to spend our money. No. Um, so, and, and we don't think it's a problem with our, with our proposition or our design. Or our, yeah, we, we think our research process are great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we're going to ask you, because some people need to leave uh, sure. for two. So I think what we'll do is wrap up and take a quick break. Okay. I mean, some, some opportunities for questions um, during the interview, so, um, oh, Margaret, and yes, yes, <laughs> sorry, I just have a, a quick gift to thank our speakers today for their time and the very interesting material that they provided. So these are two cups that have uh, some indigenous artwork on them. Uh, one is a whale that represents, there's a little write-up inside, but it represents strength and power. So we would like to give you that moving forward. Okay. And this one has a raven on it, stealing the moon. It uh, represents the trickster. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I don't know how I knew that. Um, and so this is also for your daughter. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much.